Hey, this is Huck. If you want to watch this top three asshole keep doing esports content, subscribe to Thorin's YouTube channel. When the Overwatch League Season 1 final was about to begin in New York, Volamel, journalist within the scene, tweeted out that he had been declined press credentials. He didn't have any press credentials. This is a trend we have now seen occur a number of times in Overwatch's short history with the Overwatch League, Overwatch World Cup, some of the Blizzard events that they've had. And it has been a wider problem in esports history over the last few years where esports have become more mainstream. We've gotten more mainstream attention from the mainstream gaming press in general. And the main problem has been that as the games have gotten bigger, endemic press, people who come from the community, write for websites within the community, write their content for the community, have tended to be treated more and more like a hassle or something you just deal with and get out of the way. Meanwhile, you roll out the red carpet for mainstream media, mainstream gaming press. You give them everything you want. You give them every allowance, press pass space, and it doesn't even matter what they write. They can even be intensely critical. They can actually be damaging to the reputation of you, your brand, and the game and its fans and players itself. And they still nonetheless get this elevated status and superior level of treatment. So let's look at some of these cases individually. So in terms of Volamel, this is one of the very best journalists and content creators working in the Overwatch space, if not the best. He is someone who specializes in narrative content, building up the history and the storylines of the game of Overwatch, the competitive tournaments, Apex, coming to some of the lands into the Overwatch League, players' careers so you have a through thread, so that you're not just thinking, all oh, right, uh, Toby's just a player who plays for the Soul Dynasty. No, no, you can know his history when he played in Apex. So Profit just wowed everyone in the Overwatch League Season 1 Finals, right? Why not find out who he was when he was playing back in Apex and his career success or lack thereof at certain times? He's exactly the sort of person that if Blizzard loved esports and loved the esports community, and particularly for Overwatch, they'd be loving this guy. They'd embrace him. They'd promote his work. They'd want this guy at their events, telling stories, doing that. Not only that, he has no track record of controversial statements or any kind of animosity or critical stance towards Blizzard, quite frankly, because he's someone charting narratives and historical context. He's not out there writing op-eds, like criticizing Blizzard and stuff. So there's not even any reason that they wouldn't like him. So why then has this person been ignored and neglected? Here's is someone where I, I reached out to, her, I found out the details here. When the Overwatch League Season 1 Finals were announced back in May, many, many, many months before the actual finals, he contacted them at the time and tried to get press access, press accreditation, press credentials. He was given the runaround for quite a while and then eventually told, even though he'd contacted them at the very beginning, that the event was full due to space constraints. Like, you know, we've given away all the other spots. There's no more space left. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say this right now. I do not believe, reading from the outside, between the lines, knowing what tournaments are like in terms of how setup works and knowing how mainstream media operates and when they apply for press passes, I under no circumstances believe that every person who had press credentials at that final applied back in May when the, announce was, uh, the, when the announce event was announced or booked and definitely did not all apply before Volamel. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and guess at a very minimum, a few of them applied maybe a month, maybe even less before the finals. Maybe some people even wait to see which teams made it there before they went. I just do not find it at all plausible that it was entirely booked up months and months ago. And also, the idea that you couldn't fit a top content creator from your scene and due to time space constraints, not plausible. Then what happened was, because he tweeted out that he couldn't get press credentials when he was already in New York, People like me, others in the community, we made a stink about it. We pointed out that this is bullshit. Like, this is one of the best content creators. They've got to find a way to make a space for him. Like, he's someone you've got to have at your event. It got the attention of some of the owners of some of the franchise in the Overwatch League. They started to make murmurings. Like, okay, we'll look into this. Like, yeah, we agree. Like, we've got to do something about this. Eventually, Volamel got a pass. He got the press credentials. He went to the event and he created some content about it. But this wasn't the first incident like this that occurred. Another high profile incident was back when Overwatch World Cup took place last year and Harsha 
could not get press credentials. Again, one of the very best content creators we had at the time. He was doing many YouTube videos, actually in the vein of my own, but a lot more analytical. He was doing talk shows within the community. This was one of the top creators at the time. He's now gone on to become a coach for the San Francisco Shock and obviously is not a content creator to the same degree. But back then, they obviously hadn't begun yet. That was the role he was taking up. Now, he could not get a press pass for the Overwatch World Cup. He had been, again, this is someone I've talked to. He had already in the past been denied for other events when he'd applied for press passes. He's been literally ignored and neglected. Then, when he applied for the Overwatch World Cup, initially, he was fobbed off with the excuse that the new PR guy for Blizzard came from Call of Duty and so didn't know him or didn't understand that he was a top content creator. He actually applied numerous times, including the first day applications opened for press accreditation. And yet, it was actually then later discovered that people were being told within Blizzard, Blizzard people telling others within the community when we later on kicked up a stink, oh no, he didn't apply on time, or you know, he was actually like tardy in terms of when he got around to asking for it, just literally lies. So what happened? Well, same exact mechanism. People like me, people like Monty, people like others kicked up a stink on Twitter. Like, what is this? This is one of the top content creators. Of course he should be there. What do you mean there's no space? How can this guy not be given one? He's an obvious person from the endemic community. Now, there was actually a problem here where... Once I started bringing this to people's attention, Monte Cristo, top commentator for the game, someone heavily involved with the broadcast side of things, also agreed. But because he saw Nate Nancer, commissioner of the Overwatch League, tweet something along the lines of like, oh, you know, we'll get him one or we'll sort it out or that's being taken care of. Monty thought, oh, okay, it's being taken care of. Now, what actually ended up happening is yes, Harsha got some press credentials. He didn't get his own press credentials, though. He ended up having to use a pass that multiple people used, and therefore he had to wait for someone to come back with the pass so he could go in somewhere, he could go check some out, and it was being passed between more than two people, this pass. That's the sort of clown fiesta fucking joke that this setup was with top content creators that are already established in the community. Now, you know what? Let's say for some bizarre reason, some of the background to this has some basis to it. You know, the PR people within Blizzard don't even know or follow the endemic esports side of their game and don't know any of the top content creators. Now, that's not acceptable. That's absolutely a joke, quite frankly, as far as I'm concerned. It shows you don't care about the community and where are the community liaison people who can inform you, who can vouch for you. But okay, let's accept that premise for a moment. Are we to believe that the same people involved in PR, I mean, why someone would be all involved with like liaising with the press who doesn't know the press. I don't understand that myself. The person put in charge of giving out the press passes should have an understanding of who the press are and who we want at the event, right? Or you could go with the angle that Blizzard didn't want these people there. And when there was enough of a fuss kicked up, they had to let them in so it wasn't bad PR because now they had uh, some leveraged, leveraged against them, which is we'll give you bad PR if you don't come and let these people in. Okay, you could go with that theory as well. But are we going to really believe that these Blizzard esports people didn't know who I am? Now, I've been involved in esports for, I think, 16 or more years professionally as a journalist. Admittedly, I haven't heavily been involved with many Blizzard games. I was involved with StarCraft 2 for a couple of years, going to many big events, doing a lot of big interviews. But in the latter years, I've gotten involved with Overwatch somewhat, obviously been doing a talk show oversight with Monte Cristo, the number one commentator, the face of broadcasting within Overwatch. And we began that back in 2016, long before the Overwatch League. But you know what? I went to LA at the beginning of this year to stay with Monte Cristo, he's a friend of mine personally, as well as a work colleague, and also, with good timing, to see some of the other people in the Overwatch League, some of my friends Crom, Semler, Harsha, all these other people, Reinforce, Sideshow, and also to attend the first games for the Overwatch League, the start of Season 1, because, you know, it was a big deal, I wanted to see how it was going, I wanted to see how my friend's venture would go, I hoped it would all go great. So because I was coming here, and I was attending, I wanted to attend the event. Monty reached out to them, contacted them, said, oh, can Cathorian be put down as like a guest of mine? Or can he be put down as press or something? He made numerous requests of Blizzard in days prior to the... Uh, prior to the event, messaging numerous different people, asking me to send emails in, asking if I'd heard anything back from them. We weren't hearing anything back from these people. But I was told, you know what, don't worry, I've taken care of this, you're going to be on the list. <clears throat> so I went along, day one, and I joined the queue where all the press was, and they were leading up to like a, a little tent that said something like, you know, press or something along the lines, or media or whatever. And I got there, 
waited my, my turn, got to the front of the queue, and the person there had a clipboard, and they said, what's your name, or what's your email address, told them, and wasn't on the list. Now, when you're not on the list, they then start asking more questions. So, first of all, they consult with the other two or three people who are at this table, like, oh, he's not on the list, like, is he on your list, is he on another list, is there a problem here? And I was telling them, oh, well, the things I've actually been uh, put on the list, Monte Cristo requested I am, I'm a friend of his, and I'm also a journalist, and you could also ask little Susie, who, I mean, at the time, she didn't work with the Spitfire, but, you know, she was around as well, she knew everyone, she definitely knew these people. You can ask these people, these people have asked me. They start just asking me basic questions, though, thinking that, like, uh, ignore whatever he's saying now, it's just some guy trying to blag his way in the event. They started asking me stuff like, uh, okay, Duncan Shields, um, what website do you publish for? What, what what media outlet are you with again? And I said, well, I do write for de- for dot .esports, which obviously, by the way, is a very big esports website, but I'm actually here primarily for myself. And I publish, I have a YouTube channel with a lot of subscribers. And when I was saying all this stuff, they kept looking at me as if like, ah, oh, YouTube channel, eh? As though like I was someone with 100 subscribers. By the way, I have over 250,000 subscribers. They're as though, you know, I just had 100 subs or the equivalent of like if you tried to go to the White House and say, oh, can I have press credentials? And they're like, what's your publication? You're like, oh, I have a WordPress blog. And they'd go like, oh, okay, son. Well, you know what? Um, I'll take your request, but I think we're going to be pretty full. I don't think we're gonna, you know, I don't really know that we do those sorts of, uh, you know, sort of for the public generally. You have to sort of be like a, a real press to get, no, that's kind of the vibe we're getting, right? Now, here's the detail for you. To actually get into this event, I had to actually find little Susie around this area, bring her over and say, listen, they're not letting me in. They they have no clue I am. In fact, they they don't seem to have any clue whatsoever that I'm even a real journalist. That luckily, she was able to go find someone else, call them, talk to them, get me into the venue. Now, here's some context for you. This all took place at the same time, early 2018, as I was the reigning Esports Industry Awards, Esports Journalist of the Year for 2017. I had won that award only a couple of months prior. So in theory, as the most high-profile esports journalist in the world. If you go and look at the numbers of uh, subscribers on my personal YouTube account, you go and look at the number of Twitter followers I have. Again, I would suspect in terms of raw influence, exposure level, probably the most well-known esports journalist in the world. None of these people had any clue how I was. Even when I started to tell them, nothing twigged. They didn't Google anything. They had, as far as they were concerned, anyone, a total random person who applied but had a, a real media outlet name like Kotaku, they'd get straight in. They'd be in immediately. They'd be on the list, definitely. Someone like me, not on the list. Now, why is it even significant to know who the press are? Well, first of all, because of the, the subreddit split where r slash Overwatch basically is barren of esports content and all the esports content's on competitive Overwatch, it's already hard enough for content creators to make a name, to become big name people. And this behavior, quite frankly, is reminiscent of Riot. They also did a similar thing. They had a big league. They had investment there. They had a lot of eyeballs. They had a lot of endemic content creators making stuff, but they never acknowledged them. You could get in eventually if you apply for press passes. They didn't have as big problems as this, but they would never promote your work. They'd never retweet your work. They'd never mention your work. You didn't exist. There was just stuff on LOL Esports and the team websites, and that was it. And they pretended as though you didn't exist, and you were like some sort of parasite on on their back, even though in reality, you were something helping to keep their game fresh, give it lifeblood, create shoulder content, keep fans engaged with their content. Yet what's bizarre is... In a huge league like the Overwatch, massive, insane press uh, exposure outside of esports, massive investment. They're ignoring already the limited, depleted, dilapidated endemic scene and giving it no life, no no sort of chance to succeed. And what would happen if someone like me wasn't there to kick up a stink? It seems like the two people I've mentioned before, who it was injustice they didn't have press passes and credentials, despite following all the rules, would never have gotten in. They would, it's only someone like me and others creating a stink, making this a big deal that even got these people in in the end. That's what it took. Blizzard themselves didn't have an internal process, which is error correcting or has some sort of appeal process or way for someone to reach out and say, you've made a mistake here. They would have just denied these people outright and therefore these people would be discouraged. They wouldn't produce content and you'd have significantly less endemic coverage of these events. You'd have to stick with the Kotakus, the Polygons of the world. Speaking of which, how come Blizzard doesn't know any of the traditional esports people, endemic people, but they know all the bad guys they know polygon and kotaku and these websites that come to write hit pieces 
that people I've seen get press passes and have space given to them at events, getting table space specifically. Oh, here you go, sir. I've got this for you here. Despite the fact we are now talking about dozens. We're talking in the double digits of hit pieces that have smeared Blizzard. Overwatch League teams, Overwatch fans as bigots, as people discriminating against certain ethnic groups, against certain sexes within their field. These people can do all of this and they never get limited press access, told, sorry, no space for you next time. They are ushered in. They have the red carpet rolled out for them. At that Overwatch season one where I couldn't get in, I even saw at the event someone who had written a hit piece about me lying repeatedly about me and my content for a few months earlier because I'd won that esports award and someone who had barely ever done any esports content beyond that hit piece on me. They did a couple of small posts. They had no standing within the community. They weren't even writing for a big name games website, frankly. They had a press pass. They had space given to them. Where are the harshes and volumels of the world, though? Someone like Blizzard, if they want esports to be a big thing and have an endemic esports community, has to be in touch with that community. They have to at least give space and access to that community. If not, I would suggest just promote their content. But if you don't want to do that, that's not necessarily what your prerogative is. Now, in terms of the idea there are space issues, as I said, that doesn't even apply to the first two examples of Harsha and Volumel. They applied from the very beginning when it was possible. This was just an excuse given to fob them off because either people didn't know who they were or explicitly didn't want them there, wanted to keep that space for someone who might come from the Wall Street Journal or something along those lines. Even if there were issues there with space, when we're talking about the best people, literally exceptional people, you can make exceptions for them. You can fit one more person in that press room. I've been to so many press rooms, including the Overwatch one, where half the press there were doing literally fuck all. They were just using this as a cool thing of like, oh, we've got like four people from our site. One, one of us is coming to record interviews. The rest are standing around talking. They're watching the games on the big screen. They're drinking the free water. They're hoping to talk to a player, but they're not even doing interviews with them. The amount of sheer number of people just buy hand or on computers just transcribing what was said in the press conference but not doing any actual content at the event and then going home and doing posts and videos about was staggering to me I couldn't believe how far back in time because it's more of a traditional sports media approach we were like where's the esports side of this where you got all the interviews and all that sort of shit you don't have to wait just for only for the press conference like I say this wasn't even as though the space was being used in an efficient manner by who was let in so when you consider Overwatch League I want it to succeed. I'm sure most people want to succeed. I know the endemic press wants it to succeed. This is the game they've chosen to cover, the game that they love. We've got to have an endemic esports press. They're the people who have the expertise and the connections to create the good storylines, to chronicle the history of the game, to convey what is meaningful, exciting, and epic about the game. Give us insight, in-depth interviews and commentary, articles, analytical work. Mainstream press can't do any of these things. They are so ham-fisted when they do attempt it. And the majority of the time in esports at the moment, they are not attempting it. They are doing very low effort, outrage, clickbait farming by smearing and misrepresenting esports. So does Blizzard care about the esports press? Does it just ignore it outright? Because I wanted to believe in the early days when I heard from people like my friend Monty and some of the people on the inside at Blizzard, no, no, we've got people who know about esports. They care about esports here. Like it's going to be different from Riot. It's not going to be that approach. That whole veneer has fallen away for me entirely. My, my, my perspective, knowing certain things inside and then reading between the lines as an outsider is that there are some people within Blizzard and within the Blizzard esports side that certainly do know about the game, certainly do know about the community, care about esports, have a background in esports, want it to go well. The problem is they are overruled, they are underpowered, un given, not given enough responsibility and decision making, or they are just frankly too busy with their job, putting out fires, making things work to be able to fix or oversee any of these things. And so at the moment, it's a disastrous state for the endemic press in Overwatch. This video was kindly supported by Dean Tanglis, Gardner Wilson, Andreas Snazor Westerland, Alex Adams, Eddie Wingfors, Daniel Yordanov, Robert Baxter, Travis Greb, Kyla Harris, James Harding, Cesar, and special thanks go out to Matt Schakowsky and Jerky's Minion in particular. Want teasers for my upcoming content? How about asking me a question for my monthly AMA? Do you want to take part in a discussion about esports with me? How about suggesting a topic or a guest for my content? Put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today.